morning all on this Pentecost Sunday. Wonderful to be together again. We are going to uh, deviate a little this morning in view of Pentecost from our theme on Peter, even though Peter comes into Pentecost uh, after his restoration. But I thought it would be fitting for us to uh, speak on Acts 1 and 2 this morning as opposed to continuing with our study of Simon Peter. And so let us begin this morning as we look at God's Word from Acts 1. We're going to just be reading selected verses from Acts 1 and Acts 2. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. Amen. Let's turn to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Spirit of life, present from the beginning of beginnings, present in the message of the prophets, present in provision for your people, present in the life and words of Jesus, present in the cross and crucifixion, present in the lives of the apostles, present in the church that you empower, your spirit, the presence of God in hearts and lives. Spirit of life, fill our emptiness with your fullness. Spirit of power, stir our hearts afresh from within. Spirit of love, touch us and through us, our neighbor. Spirit of creativity, enable and empower the gifts you have given. Spirit of eternity, draw us ever deeper into your kingdom. And now we ask, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us as we hear your word. Quicken your word in our hearts that we may understand. In Jesus' name. Amen. So today, being the day of Pentecost, brings me to a theme that I'd like to look at, and I've simply entitled it, Inadequacy Encountering Sufficiency. Inadequacy Encountering Sufficiency. David Hoke is a well-known speaker, and he 
speaks of having a sense of our own inadequacy as being a gift and recognizing that we have a need may be the first step in seeing that need met. In today's world, feelings of inadequacy and insufficiency are portrayed as contrary to the principles of success. We are told to assert ourselves, to be confident, to stand our ground if we are to be successful. Of course, there is some truth in that. But the other truth is that most of us simply do not live in that space. In fact, if the truth be told, even great athletes, skillful riders, astute entrepreneurs, high-powered businessmen and women, accomplished musicians and actors all struggle with the feelings that plague so many of their admirers. For some feelings of inadequacy are a daily grind, not an intermittent occurrence. Sure, many times we put on a facade in order to appear confident, to appear assertive, but more than often we feel just the opposite. The fact is many are troubled by the future, worried by the present, as so many are right now, trying desperately to to balance work and family and a whole host of other commitments, trying to be good parents and providers, good role models, good wives, husbands, good members, and so on. And all of that places these demands upon us. It's a juggling act, and the more often than not, we drop the ball. And when we do, the more inadequate we feel. So let us look at this amazing event of Pentecost in the light of this. And the first thing I want to speak to is facing inadequacy. This is exactly what each one of the disciples had to do. For just a few years, they had been witness to some of the most profound happenings in history. They had been walking with probably the most influential person in history. And daily they were experiencing the miraculous. Listening to amazing teachings, seeing lives healed and transformed, seeing the wisdom of the world being brought to naught. It was a time of high adventure. And not only that... Each one of them had forsaken all they had to follow Christ. They'd given up their nets, their livelihood to follow Him. Today we would probably classify them as being fanatics. And yet in spite of what the world saw, there was a a worldliness about them that even the gospel writers themselves are unashamed in recording. They tell, for example, of how on the night before his crucifixion, some of the disciples were found arguing among themselves as to who would be the greatest. James and John had a dispute on who would sit at Jesus' right hand. On another occasion, some had urged Jesus to rain fire down from heaven on those who refused to believe his teachings when people brought their babies to Jesus to have him touch and bless them, some of the disciples intervened and rebuked them. They had this self-imposed authority. They were ungracious, unloving, harsh and uncompassionate. Now we've been looking at Peter over these last seven or so weeks the disciple who came across as probably the strongest of all of them, full of courage, full of bravado and confidence, but all self-centered. And as a result, he failed over and over again, as we've seen, and each time he had to come face to face with the reality of his own inadequacy. After the crucifixion, we find many of the disciples fleeing the scene, And we have this picture of them in the upper room, a desolate, 
fearful, helpless, powerless group of men. They were full of knowledge, but they were also full of themselves. Their real understanding of the kingdom and kingdom values was pitiful. They struggled to grasp the meaning of the Old Testament that spoke of the coming suffering Messiah. Even after his resurrection, Jesus rebuked them for their slowness of heart to understand and believe what they read in the Scriptures. Their adventure with Jesus seemed to come to an end in his crucifixion. And yet out of that depth of despair and despondency comes the excitement of hearing that Jesus has risen from the dead. And then he appears among them and proves that it is so. But just as soon afterwards he is gone again, this time for good, after leaving them with some parting instructions to go to Jerusalem and to wait for the promised Holy Spirit. But at this point they had no real idea of who the Holy Spirit was, what he was talking about. But they did as he commanded. And they waited in that upper room in Jerusalem, plagued by questions with very few answers. What they knew so astutely was that they, each one of them, had failed their Lord. And they felt desperately unworthy and desperately inadequate. I wonder if you're in a place like that this morning where you feel desperately unworthy and inadequate. We need to face our inadequacy, which is what the disciples had to do. I was reading a while ago about the life of Dr. Frank Lobach, who lived in the early part of the 20th century. He was a man who went to seminary, became a pastor. He went to the Philippines to become a missionary. But then things kind of fell apart in his life. And it looked like his life work was going to count for absolutely nothing. He and his wife lost their three children to malaria. And then he was separated from his wife and their one remaining son for health reasons. And then an amazing thing happened. As he sat alone, isolated, looking at a life of nothing up to that point, when he was about in his mid-40s, he encountered God. He discovered that it was possible to live in intimate communion with God through the Holy Spirit, and his life turned around. He reached that part of the world for Christ. And then in a subsequent season of his life, he developed a passion for for world literacy. He started the world literacy movement. In fact, many today ascribe the saying or phrase, each one teach one, to Frank Lobach. He eventually became an advisor to presidents, and then nations in the field of literacy. And it was in this time of isolation, this time of discovery, while sitting on a mountain, contemplating his life as a failure, separated from pretty much everyone that he loved, that he wrote these words. And I quote, As for me, I had never lived I was half dead. I was a rotting tree. Until I reached the place where I wholly, with utter honesty, resolved and re-resolved that I would find God's will. And I would do that will, though every fiber in me said no. And I would win the battle in my thoughts. It is as though 
some artesian well had been struck in my soul, and strength came forth. I do not claim success even for a day, yet in my mind, not complete success all day, but some days are close to success. And then he goes on to say, every day is tingling with the joy of glorious discovery. And that discovery is eternal. That discovery is undefeatable. You and I shall soon blow away from our bodies. Money, praise, poverty, opposition, these make no difference. For they will all alike be forgotten in a thousand years. But this spirit which comes to a mind set upon continuous surrender, this spirit is time's life. The spirit which comes to a mind set upon continuous surrender, the spirit is time's life. So firstly, facing our inadequacy. But secondly, encountering sufficiency. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You see, friends, only when we face our inadequacy will we be in a place where we can encounter His sufficiency. And that is what Pentecost is all about. An encounter with the living God. That is its real significance. The living God, the person of the Godhead, the Spirit of God. Don't miss the details of that day. Many preachers have focused, unfortunately, on the mighty rushing wind or the visible tongues of fire or the fact that they spoke in many other languages of that day. Those were secondary to the real significance of the event. It was an encounter with the Spirit of God. God moved in. By His Spirit, God took over. They were filled and clothed with power from on high. Pentecost means that God is in charge. And talking about charge, what happened on the day of Pentecost has often been likened to electricity in a light bulb. There's no light in the glass. There's no light in the filament or within the bulb. The light only comes when these elements receive the electric current, when they receive the power. When the switch is turned on, electrical energy is converted into light energy. What happened at Pentecost was a transforming event. On that day, God came down in power and changed the lives of these men and women. They were plugged in, as it were, to the power. So much so that they were accused of being drunk. Which they were. They were drunk in the Spirit. How we need that today in our church. When those who are called by His name are able to acknowledge their inadequacy and take hold of His sufficiency through the power of His Spirit. The primary sign of the Spirit's activity is always life. When the Spirit is present, people become animated, empowered, awake, energized, inspired. We even reflect that in our own language. We talk about a spirited person or a spirited creature as one in whom life and vitality flow freely. You are not designed to do life. You are designed to live life in the power of God's Spirit. Let me just say a few words about these two terms that we so often read in 
and around which is so much confusion today, baptism in the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, in Acts 1, 4 to 5, Jesus said to his disciples, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Speaking of Pentecost. On two occasions in, Mark, in, in Matthew rather, and Luke, we are told that John baptized with water, but Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus' baptism is, is more than just a forgiveness of sins. It is about the entrance into a new way of life, an empowering of His Spirit. The Old Testament, you see, look forward to the day when the Holy Spirit will be made available fully to all people. In such an abundance that it will be poured out like a flood on barren, drought-stricken land. That is the picture of what would take place on the day of Pentecost. The image that is used is that he will be poured out. And later in that same text in Acts 2, Peter is explaining what has happened and he quotes from that wonderful passage in Joel when the prophet declares that one day God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Peter says that's just what you've witnessed. This is what was referred to as the baptism or outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in the New Testament are we ever instructed or commanded to be baptized in the Holy Spirit as if this was a unique subsequent experience that we should be seeking after, after we have been converted. And yet time and time again we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. For example, in Acts 4, 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, In Acts 6, 3, the disciples are giving instructions for the selection of men who will care for some of the poor and needy. And we read, Therefore, friends, select among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. And then in verse 5, what they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Again in Acts 7.55, we read, But Pete, uh, a Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. So let me just clarify that. The phrase to be full of the Spirit is not a mechanical phrase. It does not mean that the Spirit is this kind of substance or, or vapor or liquid that you fill a glass with. It does not mean that sometimes you have more of the Spirit and sometimes you have less of the Spirit. The Spirit is not a, a force or a substance. The Spirit is a person. And so this language is an attempt to describe what is beyond words. And Luke uses a picture or a metaphor to describe what Frank Lorbach was talking about. To be full of the Spirit is a picture or a metaphor of a life in which the Spirit holds an unswerving sway, unhindered sway. It's a picture of what happens when we allow the Spirit to guide our thoughts, our perceptions, and our actions. It's what happens when my normal tendency toward anger, self-centeredness, and deceitfulness have been replaced by what? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control and I become full of his life. We sometimes hear people referring to another as being just full of it. And of course we know what that it is referring to. But to be full of the Holy Spirit means to be in total surrender to the Spirit, to be overflowing with the life and the fruit of the Spirit. And so as we close this morning, 
I want to invite us to challenge us to embark on an adventure of daily being filled with the Holy Spirit, being surrendered to the Spirit, resolving and re-resolving, as Frank Lorbach said, to yield ourselves to the Spirit, even though every fiber of our fallen nature says no. Somebody said God only fills empty vessels. And there's a real sense in which that is true. What we may need is to come to a place of emptying in our own lives, facing our inadequacy and encountering His sufficiency. And so just a couple of things I'd encourage you to do, to empty yourself of this week and beyond as you seek to live a life in the fullness of God's Spirit. The first is to empty yourself of noise and clutter and busyness. When we look at the life of Jesus, despite such a demanding schedule, he would always set time aside to go up onto a mountain to withdraw for silence and prayer. And if you don't do the same, your life may be so filled with noise and stimulation and busyness that when the Spirit does come as a gentle breeze, which is so often how the Bible describes Him, you just won't hear. I wonder if there's anyone here watching this today beside me who has a life that is so often full of noise that you do not always have the time to draw aside and to listen to that small, still voice of His Spirit. And so can I urge you this week, if that is you, to make a point of setting that time aside and growing still in His presence and asking the Holy Spirit to come and fill you, encountering His sufficiency. But in the light of what we said about facing our inadequacy, we said earlier that, like the disciples, before we can be filled, we must do that. We must face our inadequacy. And that is what Frank Lobach did. That may mean God leading us to a place of brokenness and a place of deep introspection. David once said, a broken and a contrite heart, O Lord, you will not despise. In other words, coming clean with God. And I've used this illustration before, but I think it so clearly sums up what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we were young, we used to have these fountain pens. We used to go and buy a bottle of ink. Never understood why it was called quink. But we used to buy a bottle of ink and we used to take our pen and they often used to be refills, which was a later invention. But in the early days, you had to fill it up with ink. And you would unscrew the nib and you would pour the ink into the, the tube, and then you would put it together again. And after writing for some time, the ink would start dropping, the level would drop, and, and then the nib would start getting full of gunk. It would get full of dirt that was on the paper that you were writing on, and eventually the little spurts of ink would blob all over your page. And it was so frustrating because, you know, it would spoil the whole page. You had to start again, and you would go through to the bathroom and unscrew the nib and wash it out. And then once the nib was completely free of any, any kind of uh, material or gunk, as I call it, you would put it together again and fill it up and, and you'd start writing. And it would be a bit watery at first, but it would then just start flowing just so beautifully across the page. Friends, that is so often what our lives are like. Our lives, as we rub shoulders with the everyday world and, and all the stresses and all the th issues that we are faced with, we get filled with gunk. We get filled with debris and, and rubbish. 
And every now and again, we, we need to be cleaned. We need to be cleansed. We, only, we can only be filled when we are cleansed. Because God's Spirit cannot flow through a, a vessel that is full, a vessel that is dirty. And so we have to be cleansed of all that, that gunk in our lives. We have to come clean, in other words, with God. We need to face our inadequacy. And only when we face our inadequacy are we able to take hold of His sufficiency. Friends, Ephesians 5, 8 says, Be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is a continuous, ongoing filling. It's not a one-off event that we can refer to and say that was when I was filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's an on day, on, ongoing event every day. Because every day we, we find ourselves just getting sucked more and more into the world. And every day we have to face our inadequacies like Peter did, like the disciples did. And we have to confess our sin before the Lord and allow Him by His Spirit to cleanse us of all that gunk so that once again His Spirit can flow in and through us. And so I urge you this morning, as you go into this week, empty yourself of the noise and the busyness. Empty yourself of the sin that so hinders us and confess it to God and ask Him by His Spirit to come and fill you. And so may we face our inadequacy and encounter His sufficiency as we seek His face and ask for that filling of His Spirit. And so bless you. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this amazing event on the day of Pentecost. For your spirit came upon 120 or so disciples and empowered them and gave them the, the zeal to go out and proclaim your word. We thank you for the transformation in Peter who just a short while before had denied you, had but betrayed you in that sense, and yet here he is standing up declaring who you are and what has happened. Lord, may we be like Peter. May we be like those disciples. May the zeal of the Lord consume us as we go out in the power of your Spirit to do what we can only do in the power of your Spirit. And so we confess, Lord, that all too often we feel inadequate. All too often we are tainted with the world. All too often we sin against you, we fail you, Lord, and we ask that you would cleanse us this morning, even as you would cleanse the nib of a pen, Lord, that you would cleanse us so that your Spirit can flow in and through us to the world around us, that we might make it a difference in the world, even as Frank Lobach did. Oh God, just hear our prayers this morning. And let us commit ourselves to walking closely with you and living the life that you want us to live in the power of your Spirit. And we ask this and we, we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So bless you, folks. Have a wonderful Sunday, wherever you are. And uh, we'll see you again next week. And this time we will conclude our series on... Uh, Peter, as we look at his restoration in John 21. Bless you all.